is Dr. Nicola Khan. She's a scholar of anthropology and psychology and the director of the Center of Spatial, Cultural and Environmental Politics at the University of Brighton. She specializes in diverse fields spanning issues of violence, migration, subjectivity and mental distress. Her focus of work is in the regions of Pakistan, Afghanistan and Afghan di diasporas. She's authored multiple books over the years, including the most recently published Cityscapes of Violence in Karachi from 2017. Due to her interdisciplinary expertise in multiculturalism, social and psychological anthropology and human geography, she offers a really insightful perspective to the topic for today. So I'm just going to hand over. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you so much, Amira, and thank you, Nosheen, too, for your very kind introduction and the invitation uh, to speak. It's an honour and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, just to add a little bit about uh, my background, on, uh, to my background, which has been about, predominantly about violence, conflict and migration. I researched uh, young men's violence in Karachi's MQM party uh, some years ago now. I've just finished um, a, quite a long project on Afghan migrants in the UK and Pakistan. I have a book forthcoming with the University of Minnesota Press uh, this year. And I've recently been working in a hospital in Paris with undocumented uh, Pakistani migrants with HIV and hepatitis. So today's topic is quite a new research topic for me. And I think the best that I can do is probably to offer some reflections. I'm also very aware that I'm talking from the UK to a Karachi audience about Karachi and Sindh and for that reason it will be a privilege to learn um, more from local experts in the audience and from panellists. So what I'm going to do is to turn my video off, I don't want to disrupt this workshop with um, my bad connection at this end and I'll turn it back on afterwards. Thanks very much. Okay, so. Today I'm going to take the mega city of Karachi with its population of around 25 million in Sindh province for thinking first about, well, for thinking about gender violence and climate change in South Asia. So conceptually within the larger project, I do see climate change impacts on cities as a form of urban violence. And this isn't so new. I mean, there are well rehearsed approaches in in anthropology and sociology, going back to Bourdieu and Galton, that conceptualize violence as assuming, as Farhana said, multiple interrelated forms on a continuum, if you like, of structural, institutional, political, economic, cultural, and symbolic violence. So in this reading then, gender hierarchies are naturalized, inseparable from societal patriarchy, on a continuum with physical violence and exacerbated in crisis situations such as military lockdown, urban conflict and climate change. So in, fr in framing climate change and urban violence, we must, I think, account for the social and the local ontology of the urban, not just the large spatial, regional and global dimensions as per, for example, Brenner and Schmidt's planetary urbanization thesis, in order to effectively implement policies or engage with policies such as the International Paris Climate Agreement, the recommendations of the IPCC, and to avoid the worsening of deadly heat waves that threaten South Asia's very habitability. So then to situate the Sindh Karachi region locally, Karachi's endured intense, long-standing political party and military violence over several decades, during which women carried many additional burdens, including the killings, the imprisonment, disappearances of sons, fathers and husbands, rape and domestic violence, and losses of freedom and income due to strikes, curfews, price hikes, and norms that largely confine them unless they're wealthy or poor to domestic spheres. So political violence we know co-occurs with hugely increased rates of domestic and sexual violence against women. Um, we know this from studies, for example, law many decades ago from Palestine by Andrea Dworkin and others. And in the Irish conflict, uh, Nancy Shepherd Hughes sees the family as the most intimate and violent social institution, a site of brutality, mental torture, sexual abuse and murder. So in Pakistan, honor crime, stove burning, settlement and child marriages, acid attacks, rapes and sexual abuse are endemic. And in 2010, the Human Rights Watch documented 50%, they say, of all honor killings occurring in Sindh. 
But notwithstanding, women activists, medics, academics and lawyers have long fought for changes. Just for example, the late human rights lawyer Asma Jahangir prominently fought for human rights. Interestingly, she also defended um, the M3M party leader, Adar Hussein. But anyway, so the point to make is that even in peacetime, violence is endemic. The 2019 Women, Peace and Security Index around Pakistan very low on discriminatory norms for women, 164 out of 167 countries, and the worst South Asian country. And the Sustainable Development Goals Gender Index ranked Pakistan also very low, 113 out of 129 countries. Around 12.2 million girls are out of school. And we know less educated girls marry young, become mothers young, and face lifelong health challenges. And in Sindh, women's literacy is as low as 11% in some rural areas. And polygamy, also common in Sindh, makes wives highly vulnerable if husbands withdraw their financial support. So the medical anthropologist uh, Paul Farmer con connects structural violence, associated health problems, and shortened lifespans in what he calls pathologies of power and argues that we must keep analyses of structural violence up front if we're to uh, advance equal rights in public health. But of course, that applies everywhere, that women are marginalised and invisibilised, such as in the law, which fails women's rights and punishes women victims of rape. So all of this then is a lead in for thinking about climate change, which, as, as Fahana said, firstly affects people in the global south, including South Asia, and secondly, minority migrant groups and women disproportionately. And therefore, climate justice and climate change communication must mean elevating those voices. So climate activism has historically been a middle class pursuit and minority activists have been ignored, especially in informing policy discussions or what Naomi Klein calls the violence of othering in a warming world. And addressing climate change impacts then requires highlighting the experiences of the most marginalised, including women, by elevating the voices of, say, feminist uh, political ecologists, media experts, indigenous rights campaigners and lawyers and activists. So next, I'm just going to briefly frame some climate change impacts in Pakistan. And these include the effects of receding Himalaya glaciers on the Indus River system, increased variability in monsoons, desertification, reduced hydropower, severe floods, droughts and food shortages. So these climatological, biophysical and socio-economic impacts, which include minoritization, gender equality, poverty and exclusion from the benefits of development enterprise, require analysing, of course, in tandem together and also using interdisciplinarity. So almost 40% of Pakistan's population lives below the threshold development level. Poverty in rural areas is almost six times that in urban areas. And in Sindh, severe climate-related events are forcing stressed populations to cities. These are occurring amidst deep structural changes in rural areas and large-scale urbanization and development challenges. And we know that migration resulting from structural and climate crisis increases poverty, greater vulnerability, tough working conditions and poor access to health services. So just turn to some specific examples. So Sindh's Tar Desert is the world's most densely populated desert. Southern Sindh's drylands face increasing desertification, land degradation, worsening heat and drought. Tar Parker district, one of Pakistan's poorest region, comprising about 2,300 villages, suffered a drought-induced famine in 2013 and 14. Many affectees from Hindu communities migrated to nearby districts and many Muslim affectees migrated to Karachi and Hyderabad to work and send uh, remittances. Severe droughts recurred in 2018. Nonetheless, in this scenario, return migration to Tar is occurring due to a mega open pit coal mining and energy pro project. So mining projects, which tend to be concentrated in specific locations, force minority communities to carry the toxic burden of the global and also South Asian dependence on fossil fuels with their markedly higher rates of respiratory illnesses and cancers. In Tar, we know that Hindu women are being recruited as dumper truck drivers and women migrants are working as domestic workers in towns and cities with some forced into sex work. 
or women left behind are heading households where men are jobless, have disappeared, migrated or died. It's hardly a picture of liberation and improved equality, I think. But incidentally, all along the global aridity line, which crosses Pakistan, uh, I.L. Weizmann maps connections between drought, water scarcity, scorching temperatures and military conflict from Li uh, Libya, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and um, Pakistan, South Waziristan. But we do know that Northern Sindh is increasingly becoming a training ground for jihadist and terrorist groups for the TTP and recruits to Fatah. So given that encroaching aridity is predicted for South Asia, I think it's quite an interesting methodology for thinking forward about uh, climate change and urban violence. Next, I'll turn to water. In Tata, where the Indus Delta covers the entire east to west coastal shorelines, soil erosion, seawater intrusion, cyclones and storm surges have propelled large scale outmigration. So since independence, water politics has produced intense contestations in Pakistan over rights, dams, language, nationalism and local power. And Fahana will know a lot more about this than me. But certainly the framing of water crises as climate change related or not affects governance and responses. Climate change and poor governance conjoined in the worst floods in national history when the Indus burst its banks, the length of Pakistan in 2010. Around 22 million were severely affected, about 7 million in Sindh. And Sindh again suffered immense destructions in floods in 2011. In the hundreds of IDP camps that were set up, Ocha highlighted the deafening silence around the protection needs of women and girls. Unmarried women, pregnant women and adolescent girls were especially vulnerable to the lack of health facilities, to sexual violence and to forced marriages. Yet still no permanent environmental migration policy exists. Through the traumatic ruptures and partitions of people from their land and livelihoods, also fractured the habituation of Sindh's riverine and fishing communities to oceans, rivers, marshland and waterways. They beg questions about ways watery landscapes evince people's feelings of enclosure and envelopment and deeper psychological structures like secure attachment, as well as about ways trauma and traumatic displacements are transmitted generationally, that is in utero, epigenetically and genetically, and developmentally between mothers and children's children. So trauma and generational trauma, we know cause, causes health, or well, they cause health problems, for example, asthma and depleted immune systems, which impede our ability to bear the impacts of climate change. So next, land. Many migrants, men and women from Sindh, settle on Karachi's agrarian periphery, pressurizing local ecologies and raising questions about the ways climate change migration across South Asia interplays with urbanization, land acquisition and development to create urban spaces of refuge and displacement. And this is a, these are issues that Noshin and also Romila Sanya, for example, have written about. So in Karachi, many migrant women from Sindh's towns and villages work in the low paid shrimp peeling industry. And while all the migration in these examples I've given is gender based, analyses of internal migration typically focus on political, economic and governance issues, not gender dimensions, meaning that women's issues are unlikely to be recognized in new knowledge or policy. So finally then, air. Karachi's urban mountains have accumulated rubbish, chronic traffic and waste problems, earthquakes and pollution, water shortages, pro prolonged power cuts and unmitigated heat now co-occur with the rapid erection of superhighways, mega transport systems and gated enclaves that have displaced Karachi's unwanted communities to the peripheries of its world class vision, as um, Noshin has written about very compellingly, also Arif Hassan. Um, so in 2008, the city mayor, Mustafa Kamal, instituted plans for a green city to combat air pollution in a very different scenario, say, to the embattled MQM mayor today. And around 2.2 million non-native conocarpus trees were planted along Karachi's major arterial roads, an example of green colonialism causing breathing problems, asthma, effacing ecological diversity, and signaling the return of an anxiety symptom around the toxicity of city politics. So in the urban prison, the air is putrid, filtered, poisonous, an intense indicator of despair, 
and a paradox of planetary urban development and progress. In imperial times, links were made between foul air, deadly diseases, crime and moral dissolution. Imperial air was also murderous, as with prisoners asphyxiated in the black hole of Calcutta, not unlike illegal migrants who suffocate in trucks en route from Pakistan to Europe today. So breathing describes the topographical interplay between body and world. Control of breathing is learnt in infancy. Crying and breathing are sometimes so entwined an infant cannot stop crying because to stop crying is to stop breathing. Breath and air are ineluctably political and ephemeral incarnates that suspend urban lives between air filters, generators and spatial designations for controlling ventilation and disease. So in the COVID-19 lockdown of recent weeks, the slogan, I can't breathe, became a rallying cry in mass global protests that erupted following the death of George Floyd from respiratory failure in police custody in Minneapolis. Black and brown people overwhelmingly at greater risk from COVID were at the forefront, while police attacked crowds with rubber bullets and tear gas, causing choking, wheezing, crying and excruciating pain. In the UK, South Asians are about a 20% greater risk of death to COVID once hospitalised and 2.5 times more likely to die than white people. So structural racism, sexism and climate change are the big political issues of our time and they must be, I've argued, tackled jointly. So if flesh comes to us out of history, the transmission of violence in the flesh must also be reckoned with in, in epidemics reprised for the present, whether these be viral, patriarchal or environmental. Progress will entail, to paraphrase the Sindhi poet and philosopher Shah Abdul Latif, swimming upstream. And very finally, there is no way to confront the climate crisis as a solely technocratic problem. It must be addressed in the context of gender violence, poverty and privatisation, colonialism and militarism. Conceptually on a continuum drawing on interdisciplinary social science, policy, climatological perspectives, and methodologically using co-produced critical feminist approaches and ethically as a project of gender equality, rights, social justice and transforming policy. Thank you.